So, I would like to wait all people to be seated, but maybe it's not possible. So, welcome everybody. I'm Sara Bagassi. I'm from the University of Bologna, and I'm a member of the Program Committee of ICAS and of the Executive Committee of ICAS. So, I'm very glad to chair this uh, general lecture, which is the second general lecture uh, we have today. Uh, it is an invited one uh, and specifically is representative uh, of one uh, of the major sponsors of this event, uh, who is Boeing, uh, that has a gold sponsorship for this event. And um, the lecture, I'm very pleased to introduce the uh, lecture speaker, uh, who is Lynn Hopper. Uh, so, uh, Lynn, Hopper, Lynn Hopper is a Vice President and General Manager of Engineering Strategy oper and Operations at the Boeing Company. In this role, she is responsible for functional excellence and integration across the company's engineering function. In addition, she facilitates the work of Boeing's Chief Engineering teams and team and leads strategic workforce planning, talent management, and enduring projects uh, such as design practices uh, and processes, as well as the deployment uh, of model-based engineering. Previously, she has also served as Vice President uh, of Engineering for Boeing Commercial Airplanes, Vice President of Boeing Test and Evaluation, and Vice President of Engineering Modifications and Maintenance for Boeing Global Services. In addition to numerous other leadership roles during her time at the company. Lynn has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Utah and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford University. So during her lecture, Lynn will be discussing the future of aerospace, the engineering challenges the industry faces, and the ways that Boeing is working to address those challenges. So Lynn, the floor is, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you to you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I thank my friends from Boeing for joining me right in the front. Uh, thank you. Um, Sarah, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, it's fun to be in service of the 56,000 plus engineers at Boeing. So let me now talk about Boeing. Uh, Boeing is building the future of aerospace. We protect, connect, and explore our world and beyond, innovating to meet the technology challenges the industry faces by bringing the expertise of a global engineering team. Today, I will share a few of the engineering challenges that we're facing today and how Boeing is transforming for the future through digital transformation, autonomous flight, AI, and sustainability. Boeing and the aerospace industry as a whole has faced unprecedented challenges, due in part to industry-wide disruption from the pandemic, supply chain constraints, geopolitical dynamics, and more. But we remain confident about the future because of the hard and important work that we've done and are continuing to do to strengthen our company and position Boeing for the future. We have made broad and fundamental changes to enhance our safety and quality systems, strengthened and elevated the independence of our engineering function, and taken important steps to drive stability into our production system. We have re relentlessly emphasized the importance of safety and quality ahead of cost and schedule, and we know that we're in a long cycle business, and the effect of these fundamental changes will be measured in years, not in quarters or months, and we believe they're the right steps to take, and we are committed to staying the course. Two of the challenges that I want to focus on today are digital transformation and sustainable uh, aviation. And I'll sh share some examples with you. I promise to have lots of uh, pictures of airplanes. Um, this is uh, truly uh, digital transformation and sustainability are some of the big challenges we think about how we need to engineer our future. So let me talk now about uh, digital transformation and I'm going to use the example of the T7A Red Hawk. Uh, we're focused on a digital transformation that encompasses the entire life cycle of our products, design, development, production, operations, and sustainment. 
Boeing launched a coordinated and integrated approach to all digital efforts to support our next suite of products and services with the digital ecosystem. This lowers development costs, reduces barriers to entry via digital prototyping, and identifies and solves problems quickly, shorting, shortening production and sustainment timelines. It also factors in end-of-life considerations such as parts recycling. And the T7A Red Hawk is just one example of how we're digitally transform, transforming engineering for the future. It is an example of the cooperation and collaboration and the partnership that we have with Saab here in Sweden. The Boeing T7A went from concept on a laptop to flight in just 36 months, and pilots were able to test fly the airplane while still in development stages, which allowed us to detect an issue with wing rock. This issue was successfully mitigated years earlier than it would have been without the digital solution, and the T7 is now providing measured metrics on cost savings. We are developing the model-based model -based engineering tool, tools tailored to our market, embracing open architectures and the latest software development techniques. Our defense team was recognized by the US Air Force as being the first to receive the E-Series designation for our groundbreaking digital work on the T7A. The T7A has the flexibility to evolve as technology, missions, and training needs change. It includes the trainer, ground-based training and support designed together from the, st the start. It was recently named the T7A Red Hawk and it will replace the T38 trainer in use by the US Air Force today. And it will train fighter and bomber pilots for generations to come. And the US Air Force uh, shows this IOC as uh, early 2024. Digit digit digitization has many aspects in aerospace, how we design and build, but also autonomous flight. And I'm now going to talk about a few programs where we're utilizing autonomy today. First, the MQ-25. Boeing and the Navy have conducted three historic aerial refueling flights with the MQ-25 test asset, known as T-1, refueling an F-A-18 Super Hornet, an E-2D Hawkeye, and the F-35C Lightning II. The flights represented the first time an unmanned aircraft has ever refueled another aircraft and were part of the Navy's broader initiative to field unmanned systems that transform and enhance the fleet's capability, capacity, and lethality. But currently, this product has over 125 test flight hours and also a demonstration on the U.S. carrier Bush in both day and night and all sea conditions. The MQ-25 is a digitally native aircraft, meaning every service and system has been engineered using model-based engineering techniques from the very start. And the current T-1 test aircraft, from the, t from the, uh, from the current T-1 test aircraft to today's EMD aircraft. The entire airframe and subsystems are representing using 3D models, creating a single source of de definition used by all the engineering disciplines across the program. Having that integrated model that is a single source of truth drives improvements in cost, quality, and efficiency because of the level of integration across disciplines. Electrification is another area we're investing in. WISC is a joint venture company between Boeing and Kitty Hawk and is a leader in the advanced air mobility space. Since 2010, we've de developed five generations of e VTOL aircraft and completed more than 1,600 test flights without an accident. With support through our strategic partnership, WISC is currently working on the sixth generation aircraft that will represent the first ever candidate for certification of an autonomous all-electric passenger carrying e VTOL aircraft in the US. The airplane you see flying here is called Cora. It's completely electric, completely autonomous, it has 12 rotors for vertical takeoff and a single propeller in the back for forward flight. Very excited for where this project is at. Um, it's about 21 feet long with a 36 foot wingspan. Its range is 25 miles with a 40 mile reserve and it travels at 100 miles per hour. This is a two passenger aircraft but the team's looking to develop a four passenger airplane. And as we work on this, develop, this capability on WISC, it's translatable to other parts of our company WISC involves high-rate composite manufacturing improvements, while other projects are aimed at hybrid electric propulsion maturation. This partnership for electrical aviation is critical to understand how we develop, test, and certify all electric vehicles and their safe deployment in the airspace. We recently invested an additional 400, 450 million, uh, establishing WISC as one of the most well-funded 
advanced air mobility companies in the world. Their sixth generation EV aircraft will be the first candidate for certification of an autonomous all electric passenger carrying aircraft in the US. And in thinking about future mobility systems and more air vehicles entering the sky, we have to think ad ahead to adapt our tools for safe and efficient travel. Today we have an air traffic management system that allows for a few thousand things in the air, but how is that going to work when there's a few million things in the air? It's not going to be humans talking to humans anymore, so there has to be more infrastructure in place. Boeing and Spark Cognition formed SkyGrid as a joint venture in 2018 where we look at how we write the software and algorithms which will be scalable and provide the infrastructure necessary to support the future of transportation and do it with security and reliability. Using blockchain technology, AI enabled dynamic traffic routing, data analytics, and cybersecurity features. SkyGrid's platform will be go, go beyond unpiloted aircraft systems, UAS, traffic management, UTM, the platform will enable SkyGrid customers to safely perform a broad range of missions and services using UAS, including package delivery, industrial inspections, and emergency assistance. SkyGrid and WISC are JVs that we started pre-COVID, but we see them as both critical technologies that will be needed in the future. Shifting to sustainable aviation, we are committed to a sustainable aviation future by shifting and innovating across the entire sustainability portfolio, investing is in what is achievable now and what is possible in the future. At Boeing, our approach to creating a sustainable future of flight is grounded in data, scientific research, collaboration, and extensive testing. The world and commercial aviation have united around a net zero target in 2050, Given our current market outlook and the cycle times inherent in our industry, aircraft entering service in the current cycle will still exist by 2050. As we move toward 2050, our global landscape will be impacted by population changes, mobility needs, and infrastructure, and by climate change. Sustainable product life cycles will be increasingly important to complement our efficient aircraft in flight. The aviation industry created 900 million tons of carbon emissions in 2019, which is 2.6% of the world's emissions and 12% of transportation's emissions. Aviation is a very hard to abate sector and given the projected growth, will continue to draw focus alongside the societal benefits. As we look to creating that sustainable future, we are united with our customers and governments around the globe in committing to bold climate change ambitions and support the civil aviation commitment to achieve net, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The future of flight will require us to sim simultaneously pursue all pathways to achieve net zero carbon emissions, something we call everything for zero. Boeing defines those pathways, everything we must pursue, as fleet renewal, operational efficiency, renewable energy, and advanced technologies. Fleet renewal delivers significant emissions improvements. The 737 MAX family, for example, leverages advanced aerodynamic design and highly efficient engines to reduce fuel use and emissions by 20% and the noise footprint by 50% compared to the airplanes that they replace. That means that every year a 737-10 would reduce carbon emissions by 1.7 million pounds compared to the competition and by 12 and a half million pounds compared to the airplanes it replaces. In the renewal energy pathway, we believe it will be a SAF and, not a SAF or solution. A few facts from our involvement in sustainable aviation fuels. Boeing has been a pioneer in making sustainable aviation fuels a reality, working with airlines, engine manufacturers, and others to qualify and conduct sustainable SAF test flights in 2008 and gain approval for commercial airplane use in 2011. In 2018, the Boeing Eco Demonstrator Flight Test Program made the world's first commercial airplane flight using 100% sustainable fuels with the 777 freighter in collaboration with FedEx Express. In 2010, we partnered with the Navy to, con to conduct SAF flight tests on an F-18 Super Hornet and with the Air Force on an in-depth fuel study as part of their efforts to certify the C-17 Globe, Globemaster to use SAF. 
Recently at Farnborough, we unveiled Cascade, a data modeling tool to show the effects of various decarbonization strategies on global aviation emissions. And as part of the SAF and approach, Boeing continues to advance the safety and viability of other renewable energy sources and their use on aircraft. Through our joint venture, Whisk Aero, we have flown over 1,600 successful test flights of a battery electric air taxi and are working on, again, the sixth generation eVTOL aircraft that will represent the first ever candidate for the certification of an autonomous all-electric passenger carrying aircraft. We also have extensive experience with hydrogen. Our learnings and insights to date come from six hydrogen technology demonstrations with crewed and uncrewed aircraft using hydrogen fuel cells, a combustion engine, and a recent cryogenic storage tank build and test with NASA. Now I want to describe the tale of two 50s. 50% 50 of commercial airplane flights are 100 kilometers or less, but that only accounts for 15% of the fuel burned. 50% of the fuel is burned on flights greater than 2,800 kilometers. That means we're not going to one solution. And that's why for Boeing, we've said sustainable fuels is the area we can have the biggest impact in the shortest amount of time. And we've committed to having our airplane certified with 100% 100 sustainable fuels by 2030. But it can't be just that. We have to be looking at other areas for shorter range flights and alternative fuels and other solutions. We must take a SAF and approach to decarbonate, to, to decarbonize aviation by 2050. It's the only way to make, meet our net zero commitments. Renewable energy is cru crucial for aviation to reduce carbon emissions inside our operations and with our products and services. For our products, renewable energy can include sustainable aviation fuels, green hydrogen, or batteries. Battery electric energy storage and green hydrogen offer future potential but require new design studies, safe certification approaches, scaling, and platform developments coupled with new system-wide ground and network infrastructure. Therefore, we see them as medium to longer term solutions that will enter the market in shorter haul segments with smaller cargo and passenger payloads. Given the near term needs for emission reductions and that the primary sources of aviation emissions are longer haul flights, our near term emphasis remains on sustainable aviation fuels, given it is widely accepted today as a drop in replacement for conventional jet fuel that work with existing airplanes and yet have substantial, substantially lower life cycle carbon emissions. SAF is in regular use today and offers the most immediate and largest potential to reduce carbon emissions over the next 20 to 30 years in all aviation segments. Boeing is taking action. In January 21, Boeing announced that we are committed to delivering 100% SAF capable commercial airplanes by 2030. In July of 21, Boeing, Sky Energy, and Sky Energy Americas announced a partnership focused on scaling the availability and use of SAF globally. Boeing will also invest in Sky Energy Americas' SAF production project. This investment includes the advanced purchase of SAF from the facility for use in company flights and other operations. In October of 21, Boeing partnered with the NASA Langley Research Center to test the emissions of SAF on the 2021 Eco Demonstrator, which was an Alaskan Airlines 737-9. We are also a founding member of the First Movers Coalition, partnering with lead companies across sectors to accelerate the development of new technologies to reduce emissions, with Boeing's emphasis on the scale-up and use of SAF. We also support the Sustainable Aviation Buyers Alliance, SABA, launching the Aviators Group and the WEF Clean Skies for Tomorrow 2030 Ambition Statement on SAF. In February of 2022, Boeing announced, announced that we purchased 2 million gallons of blended SAF for all of our U.S. commercial airplane operations, and this agreement is the largest announcement by an aircraft manufacturer. Boeing has been a pioneer in making sustainable aviation fuels a reality, working with airlines, engine manufacturers, and others to qualify and conduct biofuel test flights in 2008 and gain approval for commercial use in 2011. And in 2018, the Boeing Eco Demonstrator Flight Test Program made the world's first commercial airplane flight using 100% sustainable fuels with a 777 freighter in collaboration with FedEx Express. In addition, we partnered with our US government 
customers on SAF initiatives. In 2010, we partnered with the Navy to conduct SAF flight tests on an F-18 Super Hornet and with the Air Force on an in-depth fuel study as part of their efforts to certify the C-17 Globemaster to use SAF. To accelerate innovation for current and future airplane efficiency, our eco-demonstrator flying testbed uses partnerships to take promising features and services out of the lab and demonstrate them in the air. Our Boeing eco-demonstrator marks a decade of accelerating over 200 projects which have been tested on eight airplanes to d help decarbonize aviation, improve operational efficiency, and enhance safety and the passenger experience. This includes things like advanced technology winglets on the 737 MAX that save fuel, a laser system that can detect clear air turbulence, and landing gear that's designed to lessen noise. Approximately a third of the tested technologies have progressed onto Boeing's products and services. The 2022 Eco Demonstrator program, which is underway right now, is testing 30 sustainable technologies on a Boeing owned 777 200ER, flying on a 3070 blend of SAF and conventional jet fuel. Eco Demonstrator is a great program for our engineers to prove these technologies out before ever implementing them on a production aircraft. And the program continues to yield a huge benefit and will continue to be an important part of our sustainability journey. Through NASA's subsonic ultra green aircraft research program, or SUGAR, Boeing has been exploring and developing advanced concept, concepts for advanced aircraft that meet specific energy efficiency, environmental, and operational goals for the future. This includes the transonic truss braced wing concept shown here, which has the potential to make future airplanes more aerodynamic and environmentally sustainable. With a high wing, you can imagine the possibilities of engine configurations, other propulsion systems, and we're excited about the possibilities of this work with NASA and where it could lead. When we think about the future and sustainability goals we want to achieve, we may have to look at a different aircraft configuration, and that's why this in program is so important to aviation. Our values at Boeing start with engineering excellence. The work we do across commercial, space, defense, and services changes the world, and our engineers are at the forefront. Boeing competes for high-quality talent globally with teammates and operations in all 50 states and in more than 65 countries, including design centers focused in Ukraine, Poland, India, and Brazil. We're investing in our people and will continue hiring in key areas as the commercial market recovers and production rates expand, and we invest in innovation, engineering, manufacturing, quality, and stability. There's nothing that has flown with a Boeing name on it that wasn't the idea of a Boeing engineer, and that's why we're optimistic. Our brand is strong, the competition for talent has never been greater, but what drives people to Boeing is the mission. You can come to Boeing and you can do something that will change the world. Whether it's on the defense side and protecting freedom or on the commercial side and connecting people, Boeing isn't part of the gig economy. You can come here and build a career. You can advance your education with our generous tuition assistance program, live in different parts of the world, and gain diverse experience supporting a wide variety of products, all with market-leading health and retirement plans, competitive compensation, paid time off, and various other benefits. We are looking for experienced and early career engineers to fill key roles, including in mechanical, production, software, systems, and other engineering disciplines. We're steadily growing our engineering base by finding and upscaling the talent we need. We've hired over 5,000 engineers this year with an additional 2,800 in work. I know I'm personally very proud to work for the Boeing Company, and I'm excited about our future. With that, thank you for your time today. Enjoy today's sessions, and I hope you all take the opportunity to network and learn about the ideas and technical breakthroughs presented. The collaboration which occurs at a conference like ICAS will make the world a safer and better place. Thank you. So thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, so I expect that there are some questions raised by the audience. And you have to use okay, a microphone. There is one. <laughs> Chris, I would ask you to introduce also your name and affiliation before 
Okay, good. I think everyone can hear. Lynn, thank you very much uh, for that talk. Uh, I'm Chris Atkin. I am also a member of the ICAS program and executive committees. Uh, this is a, a question that I posed at the end of um, ICAS 2021 in Shanghai. Uh, apologies, because it's it's a strategic question, and, and I don't want you to feel that I'm uh, giving you a hospital pass. But um, my understanding, having worked in technological development, and you know, even if it's a step change or an incremental change, with we're talking about a fixed percentage improvement in system performance. Can we reconcile that with projections of year-on-year -year growth in in aircraft movements? You know, we, we discovered from the pandemic that an exponentially growing challenge is very difficult to control. And I, I worry um, that, that aerospace companies are working very hard to deliver sustainability improvements, but at the same time modeling uh, exponentially growing demand in the future. And I don't think those two approaches can be reconciled. So um, what is the thinking within the Boeing company if, if you're um, you know, uh, able to share, shed some light on that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I think you pose a really good question. Um, well, you know, um, I I think it's a problem that um, that we have to lean into. Um, certainly, uh, there's going to be more and more demand for commercial aviation, um, but yet there's also a demand to create, you know, ecologically uh, safe uh, programs such that we um, increase sustainability of what we do in aviation, and that's. I think that's exactly the challenge ahead of us. I, I don't know of anybody trying to model exponential growth um, against where we're at currently. I, I think of the production rates, and I, I struggle to imagine how we can do something exponentially unless we radically change a lot about how we currently manufacture commercial airplanes. Yes, please. About the... Luis Campos from Lisbon University. About the path for decarbonization, the two main ones for fuels are SAF and hydrogen, and it seems the priorities are a little different in Europe and the United States. Now, SAF looks like the more near-term solution. My question is, what is the time scales for it? Because for SAF, the main problem seems to be producing sufficient quantity. And there is another aspect I would like you to comment, because people just talk of drop-in fuel, but the fuel does other functions in an aircraft, like lubrication and so on. So we have also to look at that, what happens when one replaces that. The second one is hydrogen, that's a bigger technological problem and a bigger infrastructure problem. So bearing in mind, first, the scale of development investment, the fact you have current fleets, and if you go for hydrogen, it's a different aircraft. Mm -hmm. So what is the time scale for this to have a big effect on the environment? That's a really good question. Now, I'm not a fuels expert, um, but let me just say that um, you know we have to start doing something now, um, which is why we've got programs like WISC, where we're looking at small airplanes and shorter uh, ranges. Um, and also investing significantly in SAF through many different partnerships and testing, um, including you know, the purchase of uh, SAF fuels for all of our uh, operations out of uh, commercial aircraft in the US. Um, I don't think that hydrogen is a short-term solution. I definitely think it's something that we need to continue to study. I also think that there's issues with SAF in the short term, which is the volume of SAF that would be available and not wanting to disturb the world's food supplies. And so looking at uh, systems like algae in order to derive um, uh, 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 SAF-type fuels. Um, uh, again, I'm not an expert on fuels. Uh, I'm not an expert on propulsion, uh, but that's just uh, some of my answers to the questions that you ask. The hydro hydrogen production, um, is going to be a big challenge because um, you're not going to. We don't have distribution systems for hydrogen. We don't have aircraft that we could certify safely. 
using hydrogen right now. There's not even um, rules in place for how you would do something like that. I know there's experimentation going on. Uh, we've done some tests. Uh, I know of several companies that are investing um, money to try to understand how you could uh, transfer hydrogen in canisters and put them on uh, products. Um, but I think we have a long ways to go to figure out hydrogen. And I would, I would guess that you know, 20 years from now, we'll know a lot more about that. But right now, SAF, SAF is available. Paul Roush, Georgia Tech. So in 2022, the cost of jet fuel has significantly increased year over year. Has Boeing seen any increase in investments or developments in SAF as an alternative to higher jet fuel costs? Uh, that's a really good question. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that SAF is going to pick up the deficit uh, given fuel prices right now. I think there's, um, th that's a challenge that I think is being passed on buy airlines to uh, customers purchasing airplane tickets, um, just like we're all paying more right now uh, to put gas, gasoline or petrol in our cars. Um, so while we've made investments in uh, the availability of SAF and uh, SAF infrastructure, I don't think, it can, I don't think it's going to come in a timely enough fashion to, com to compete or mitigate the current cost of fuel. I think Europe is facing even worse challenges given the Russian pipeline issues, so. I think we'll have to live through this, just like pandemic. One more question. I think there is one there. I see one. <laughs> you have to be more visible, less shy when raising your hand because the room is so large. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Funk, Mellor Dolan University. Uh, my question is, how, how big is the risk? I mean, if you look at the automotive industry, um, Tesla, who sort of started completely fresh in sustainable cars, how big is the risk that the aviation industry gets a similar case? And how prepared are you for that case? Because Car industry, they have been talking about sustainable cars or electrical cars for 10, 15 years, but they actually never got into the action because all the main business is, is fossil fuel uh, engines. So is it the risk that you get stuck there also and then mm -hmm. being taken over by someone who starts up? Yeah, I think that's a huge risk. I think, you know, you look at what happened with Tesla and, um, and Volt, uh, then what's the Chevy Volt? You, but but Tesla came out and really upended the the vehicle market. You know, coming out with a high performance electric car, um, and I think that a lot of the other car companies are struggling to to re-equip themselves to be competitive in the electrical vehicle market. And I think that's the same challenge that that the traditional um, suppliers and and OEMs in uh, aviation face too, which is uh, we're so set in our ways that we can't imagine a different way and someone else can come in and uh, you know, take over the market. I think the, the one opportunity we have is the, the cost to entrance to commercial aviation is so high, um, but certainly from the bottom coming up you know, with, small, with small products like the eVTOL, you know, Cora, uh, the WISC uh, partnership that we had, I think that that shows you know, a market that would be available for many more competitors. I think most people don't realize how, how far along we are with WISC and with the Cora product that we're getting close to applying for certification. I think there's probably a couple competitors in that market. Uh, one of the things that I hope the most is that whoever does enter that market understands the principles of safety that our industry is built on and, and doesn't take, uh, you know, cor cut corners or take things for, um, uh, for less than what you know, the, we've built into our systems to have such a safe aviation industry record. Um, that that's one reason I think we should make sure that um, whether it's you know regulations or um, or other barriers to entry that they're done in a way that that keeps uh, commercial aviation safe. Okay. 
can see other. Is there any more questions? Uh, we still have if some. Okay, Ro Roland. Yeah, Roland Gerhardt, Center of Applied Aeronautical Research in Hamburg. Um, talking about ZAF, I mean, the price for ZAF will be much, much higher than for the regular fuel. So do you anticipate more fuel-saving initiatives for the traditional disciplines like aerodynamics, structural weight, and so on? Do you increase the spending for these traditional areas as well, like uh, hybrid laminar flow initiatives or something like that? Yeah, you know, when you think about aviation and how it's evolved over the past 50 years, it's been continual gradual improvements that reduce noise, increase fuel efficiency, increase, increase aerodynamic performance, you know, automate the man-machine interface in addition, you know, going from four crew to two crew. You know, so there have been numerous things that we've done um, to, to make those continual improvements. You know, some would say that uh, parts of our technology, um, we've got to the critical edge, you know, whether it's, um, you know, current engine technologies or other things. And so I, I think we still have to be curious as engineers and see if we can find more ways to evolve. Um, because um, because air travel will get more expensive as we go from you know high fuel prices to SAF availability of SAF um, and and so it requires our creativity uh, but but yes it's a challenge we faced for sure definitely thank you for uh, raising candles <laughs> such in an evident way. <laughs> Uh, I'm Carmel Matthias uh, from uh, Israel Aerospace Industries. Uh, there are projects that uh, make the airplane not uh, using its engine while taxi to take off. How do you look at these projects? It saves not much fuel, but something. Yeah, um, you know, I know we've had uh, requests from airlines to um, support them in single, uh, single engine taxi. Um, I don't think it's um, broadly supported across Boeing, but we definitely know operators do that, and it does, you know, incrementally save some fuel. Um, it's, it's a small amount. Um, uh, I know it happens. <laughs> uh, my, um, my husband is a pilot. Uh, for uh, Delta, flies 757s and 767s, so it's still all in the family with Boeing. Um, so I do hear, you know, stories about what pilots do. <laughs> <laughs> he tells me jokes about pilots too, but I probably shouldn't start telling jokes right now. Uh, no, no, not, not pilots. <laughs> There are vehicles like robots. Oh, oh yeah, robots. That's yeah, cool. yeah. I've uh, electric robots even that can deliver the airplane out to the taxiway ready to go. I think you, the the concern is you'd want to make sure you had a stinger on that product in case you had a problem starting the APU to start engines. You know, so I think you have to kind of balance you know the operational performance of the airline. And their ability to use a product like that, and then when you know when airplanes start to stack up, in you know in Hartsville, Jackson Airport in Atlanta, whatever, I think you need to have you have to make sure you can accommodate the operational aspects of something like that. There is one hand I saw. Okay, yes, thank you. Jean-François Brocard, Clean Aviation, Joint Undertaking. Coming back to the tale of the two uh, 50s you presented, uh, with 50% of the flights uh, less than 1,000 kilometers, and 50% of the fuel less than, let's say, 3,000, most of those flights are flown with machines that uh, are, are designed for a much longer range, right? Mm -hmm, Plus, looking at the increase of traffic, um, very soon, many of the airports will be uh, congested, uh, mainly the big uh, international hubs. What are your views on um, optimizing the aircraft for a smaller range and designing it for a larger capacity? That, that's a good question. I, um, I don't work in the R&D space at Boeing. Um, I know they always hate to under-optimize an aircraft. Um, they're always trying to design the longest range, the most seat capacity, um, but, but it could be a challenge that we look at actually designing shorter range aircraft. 
Um, but, you know, operators like Southwest Airlines, for example, I know will actually tanker fuel during the day so they don't have to take the time to refuel. Um, so you could congest an airport by having aircraft stack up, trying to um, utilize facilities at, at an airport. I think uh, some of the things that we need to do to better optimize airspace would be helpful, like um, being able to fly direct to, um, uh, having more flexibility with air traffic control. Um, uh, you know, I think there's opportunities to optimize airspace that, that could also save significant amount of fuel. Um, uh, I know we've done some tests in that, and I can't remember the acronym right now, um, but uh, uh, like using RNP, required navigation to performance to get into smaller airfields so that you're not congesting some of the larger airfields. Um, there, you know, people don't want to really fly uh, to London to fly to Spain. You know, they'd rather fly direct. So being able to, be, being able to optimize the airspace around that and the market around that, right? Because you also have to have the volume of people that want to go to that airport. So uh, I think there's a lot of challenges that we could maybe solve by more elegant um, airspace solutions. Murray? There is Murray there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Murray Scott from Advanced Composite Structures Australia. I'd just like to pick up on your image of the digital thread and uh, I wonder if you could expand on what your vision might be for what benefit digitalization is going to bring to your military and civil operators. Oh, that's a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, if you remember back on the picture of the T7A, there was something that we call the digital diamond. And so I, th I think most people are familiar with the systems V, where you um, decompose the product requirements down to system, down to product, and then you validate them as you go back up the other side of the V. And that's really, you know, the physical, the physical um, integration and physical validation that occurs. And we, sh we put a, a top of the diamond on top of that V, and we call that the, more the digital thread. And so that's your um, model-based engineering, your digital way of validating um, the uh, decomposition of the requirements and the, um, the integrating them back together to validate that they're all accomplished. And so that's kind of the graphical picture that we use at Boeing to talk about the digital thread and how that closes out uh, the, the systems diagram, the systems V. Does that, does that make sense, what I explained? Does that answer your question? So the benefit to the actual operator? Yeah, to, well, benefit. yeah um, you know, I don't know, I don't know that we actually have um, numbers that I could share. Um, around what we found with the with the digital thread, but we've and we've been using it, I'd say, in pockets. Um, you know, a, a solution here that optimizes the digital thread in the in a situation between arrow and structures, or a situation in the digital thread that saves money between the design engineering and the manufacturing engineering because they're using the same model. Um, I think there's still opportunities to to grow the full digital. Um, evolution, and that's one of the things that we're working on right now it, out of my organization um, across the enterprise, both commercial and defense. Um, the defense market, you know, has faster product evolution because they're constantly spinning out, um, you know, different technologies for, for government and with NASA and other places. For commercial aircraft, it's kind of a big, one big development after another, um, and, the, and they can be paced, you know, seven plus years apart. And so there's less opportunity to evolve that. Um, but, but we are piloting it in smaller areas where we make changes in a production system. How can we create a digital thread and test out you know, what happens with the manufacturing process? What happens with supply chain? Um, you know, how do we analyze the change that we're making in conjunction with, with other aspects of the product? Um, and so you know, I think there's still a lot of opportunity to be gained by the digital transformation. Um, and I, you know, I think... Uh, you know, maybe other industries are a little ahead or a little bit behind, um, but I think it's an exciting part of the future. Uh, like I mentioned on T7, they found a, a wing rock issue uh, while they were analyzing it, and we've, we've done the same thing as we've worked on product development for commercial airplanes where we've identified things um, digitally and almost wanted to wait till we could go test it to validate it. So you have to, like, you know, allow yourself 
to, um, to realize that your digital thread is a validating uh, mechanism and have enough you know, data in the background so that, so that you have confidence in, in just what the computer's telling you and you don't have to wait until you get into production. Okay, there is time for maybe one more question. Okay, so f before saying a big, big thank you and uh, a big applause to Lynn, I would like to give you the new medallion that uh, has just been uh, delivered to uh, all the general lectures speaker as a small recognition for uh, the very, very interesting and uh, big work uh, you, you are presenting. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much to you. Uh -huh. Okay, so thank you very much for attending this general lecture and uh, now it's time uh, to uh, divide and spread in the different uh, sessions. We have uh, some time to swap from one session to the next one. Um, the ones uh, who want to uh, attend uh, the session, uh, the, the, the separate session that will be in that room can stay here and for the others uh, you have to find uh, directions uh, just uh, going out from this room. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>